When you are exploring and you come across a river crossing, I don't know about you, but I get a bit nervous. There's a whole bunch of things we can do to make sure the crossing has the, got the best chance of success for us. Water has the potential to ruin your trip. You need to take extreme care with any crossing, no matter how simple it looks. My name is Marcus Wyatt. Join me as I share my passion for four-wheel drives and traveling to the remotest parts of New Zealand. If you enjoy these videos, please support me by buying me a coffee on Patreon. Join the Explore Track New Zealand team now. Anytime you cross a body of water, it is crucial to measure the depth and inspect the conditions of the bottom. Even concrete fords can't be relied upon. To always have the same depth because many of them have been damaged by floodwaters and have significant portions missing. One tip is to use Polarite Sunnies, which are a great tool to help you see through the water's surface. The Volunteer Depth Gauge Walker must have off-road driving experience. Sending someone into the water who is unable to judge the depth, the current flow, and the likely grip factor of the bottom is a waste of time and a recipe for disaster. You're also looking to avoid snags such as sharp tree branches and deep holes or large big boulders. The best shoes for walking across creeks are sandals, sailing shoes or sand shoes. Avoid wearing thongs because they can easily slide out from underneath you and get caught in the mud permanently. Short shorts, swimmers or clean undies are fine for covering the festive bits. The best water crossing measuring method is to walk one way in the track you expect your left wheel to follow and walk back in the track you expect your right side wheel to follow. The human leg makes a fine depth gauge because most of us measure around 50 centimeters to the top of the knee and that's the upper fording limit for nearly all four modern four-wheel drives. If the best route isn't obvious from the shore you may need to mark the track with branches stuck into the bottom of the river. Know your vehicle's capabilities. You need to know where your vehicle's axle and transmission breathers are located and if they are extended above the typical fording depth. Most modern four-wheel drives lack extended breathers. Many new four-wheel drives have computers located in vulnerable places and powered seats have low mounted electric motors. You need to know what needs to be protected from water injury in your vehicle. A four-wheel drive isn't a boat. Many people have distorted ideas of their four-wheel drive's capabilities, particularly when it comes to water crossings. Steel components don't like water, regardless of whether they are part of the car, truck or four-wheel drive's mechanicals. If you get water into gears or bearings, the failure is certainty. Electrical components don't like water either. Driving through water at high speed forces water into places it normally wouldn't get in. And if it's salt water mixed with sand, it will stay damp forever, quietly corroding whatever metal it sticks to. A four-wheel drive isn't a boat, but drive one into deep, fast-flowing water and you can believe you're in one. A fast current has enormous power, more than enough to float a heavy four-wheel drive off a causeway and send it over the edge. A four-wheel drive that drowns its engine and sinks to the bottom depth is almost certainly going to be a write-off because of extensive and expensive mechanical and electrical damage. Before crossing even a shallow creek, it's a good idea to stop and let the vehicle cool down a bit. Dipping a hot axle into a cold creek is a sure way of encouraging water to get sucked past the axle and hub seals, regardless of the breather arrangement on the axle. Unfortunately, oil seals are designed principally to keep oil inside the housing and not keep water out. The cooling down period also ensures that your viscous coupled cooling fan and thermostatic electric fan isn't turning when you restart the engine and drive into the water. An operating fan tries to pull water through the core, bending the blades forward in the process often far enough to cut into the radiator. Preparing for a water crossing. 
If you have any uncertainty about the standard folding ability of your four-wheel drive, you can reduce your anxiety by doing some pre-crossing preparation. Protection for the people on board is your first priority. So if there's any chance of a stranding in deep water, unlock your doors and open your windows. That way, if the engine dies and the battery shorts out, you and your passengers aren't locked inside by failed central locking or electric windows. The best protection for an engine bay is a radiator blind. You can cobble one up using a folded vinyl ground sheet, but it's better to make one before you, ha you leave home. You can cut a vinyl sheet to size that lets you jam under the bonnet above the radiator and fall down in front of the wheel bar or the grill. The blind needs to have enough tail to flow back underneath the vehicle about as far as the axle center line and sufficient width to cover the entire front of the vehicle. The idea is to make the water flow around the engine bay, not through the radiator. You can always use the blind as a ground sheet when we lie under the vehicle doing a chassis inspection or post uh, positioning a jack or something like that. If you have a snorkel, a pre-crossing check should include inspecting the clamps to ensure they are airtight and watertight. Petrol engines can be snuffed out by water on the ignition components, so they should be covered with plastic if possible or sprayed generously with water dispersing fluid. In the days before viscous fan hubs, four-wheel drive fans ran all the time. So it used to, to be normal to remove the fan belt uh, before attempting a creek crossing. That way there was no chance of the fan blades hitting the water and folding forward and hitting the radiator. With a viscous fan or an electric fan, the blades turn only when the airflow through the radiator is hot enough to thicken the viscous fluid in the hub or trigger the fan on electric switch making the blades rotate. If you allow sufficient engine cooling down time before attempting the crossing, the fan won't rotate. It's also wise to leave the air conditioning switched off during the crossing. This stops the condenser heating up and triggering the electric fan that's often fitted to the aircon condenser. How to breathe underwater. A secure snorkel ensures that no water gets into the engine air intake while the engine's running, but won't necessarily stop water ingress up the exhaust pipe or through the air cleaner if the engine stalls. Many four-wheel drive air cleaners have flapper valves that is kept shut by the engine suction, but open when the engine aren't running, so let dirt and small stones fall, fall out of the airbox. If an engine stalls mid-crossing, the flapper valve may open, letting water flow into the inlet air track. Flapper valves can be sealed with a strip of duct tape for water crossings. The engine air intake isn't the only water injury possibility. If the engine stalls mid-creek, water can flow up the exhaust pipe and into the engine. In most four-wheel drives, the air boxes are fitted with a Donaldson evacuator and four-wheel drive owners don't check this part on the air boxes. These can be stuck open by a small stick, a rock or even a bumblebee. The point is installing a snorkel is not a fit and forget exercise. It, it requires a small bit of maintenance. On my vehicle I've replaced the Donaldson evacuator with a sealed drain hose. Inside the air box I have a watertight connection using a boat skin fitting at the end of the hose, I fitted a quick action valve that forms a watertight seal at the bottom of the hose. With this small modification, I've ensured my airbox is sealed completely, but still being able to remove water caught by the snorkel while driving in heavy rain. Next, the breathers. Breathers are necessary to allow airflow in and out of the diffs, axles, lockers and transmission, as the temperature in these housings rise and fall. Most gearboxes have top mounted breathers or breather exits on the bell housing. These can be extended into the engine bay or as high as possible. There's not much point elevating just the axle breathers if the transmission breathers will go underwater. Now, this rings true for the locker actuator as well. I have a bit of a personal story here. My front locker did not engage when I needed it badly during a trip in the Rock and Pillar range a while back. 
The eagle-eyed viewers watching this video has probably noticed that the front locker actuator on the front diff is quite shiny and new. Well, it turns out my front locker issue was due to rust on the worm gear inside the actuator. So once I tried to engage the locker, the actuator motor burned out since the rust stopped it from turning. When I opened the actuator casing, there was sand and dirt inside the assembly and that got in there with the factory one-way valve on the factory breather. So you guys probably asking yourself, did he not extend the breathers on the locker actuators? Well, yes and no. I did extend the breather on the rear locker actuator, but not the front because I couldn't find the right size of rubber hose to adapt to the breather hose I was using to extend with. So I learned a really hard New Zealand $1,200 lesson to ensure you extend all those breather hoses. Extended breathers are a good anti-water insurance, but they won't keep water out. If the excellent transmission seals can pass water, and they will, if hot components are plunged into an icy cold water. The resulting drop in diff housing temperatures will cause the seals to contract, letting water pass. What technique should you use when crossing the river? All the water crossing preparation in the world won't count for much if your driving technique is faulty. Generally speaking, a four-wheel drive should be in low range for water crossings with all traction aids engaged, diff locks or traction control. Driving with spray flying, as in almost all of the photos you see in four-wheel drive magazines and on TV ads, is wrong. The aim is to make smooth progress through the water with enough speed to ensure a gentle, just breaking bow wave in front of the bull bar. This speed ensures a pileup of water in front of the engine bay and a lowering of the water level below the engine. A radiator blind pushes a water resistant shape through the water and thus gives the best bow wave. Speed is easy to regulate if the creek bottom is smooth and provides good grip. Too slow is better than too fast in these conditions. It's important that the engine be kept running, so manuals are best driven in a lower gear than is absolutely necessary to keep the engine spinning above the peak torque rev point. If the engine stalls, try to start it immediately to keep water out of the exhaust pipe. But never try to start a diesel that has taken a drink through the air intake. Starting it will cause the engine to compress water which will destroy your diesel engine. Never, never, never drive straight off after a creek crossing. Take off the radiator blind for a start if you fit it one. Always have a look underneath the bonnet for signs of the fan contacting the radiator or water entry into places it shouldn't have gone. If the axles and transmission have been submerged for more than a few seconds during the crossing, crack the drain plug and see if water has found its way in. It's likely that no damage will have been done if you drain the water out immediately. But once the water has been churned up with the hot oil into a grey emulsion, your gear life is reduced dramatically. If there is any emulsification of engine oil or transmission oil, it must be drained and the casings filled with clean, fresh oil before driving any further. If you're doing a trip that involves many creek crossings, you should be carrying engine, transmission and axle fluid. Let's look at the worst case scenario. Getting a stranded four-wheel drive out of a creek can be very, very difficult and sometimes dangerous. The first priority is safety. You can always buy another lump of steel. Get the people out of the vehicle and safely on shore. Then plan the recovery operation based on the number of assisting vehicles and the equipment you have. A tow vehicle has many times the horsepower of a winch. So if towing is an option, it should be attempted as soon as possible. If it's physically impossible to tow the stuck machine out, then it's time to winch. With the engine dead and the four-wheel drive slowly filling with water, its electric winch may be useless, particularly if the solenoid pack and or the batteries are underwater. Other four-wheel drive electric winches can be used. As many as you can line up eases the individual winch strain. 
Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the tips and tricks for safely getting your four-wheel drive across rivers. If you enjoyed this video, I would highly suggest the following video.